Suppose we run a simple random experiment, like rolling a fair six-sided die. In this experiment, we could call the sample space S. The sample space just contains all the possible outcomes of the experiment. In this case, the possible outcomes are rolling a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or a 6. Now, what is meant by saying this is a fair six-sided die? Well, typically, what is meant by fair is that all of the outcomes in the sample space are equally likely. In today's Wrath of Math lesson, we'll talk a bit about probabilities involving experiments that have equally likely outcomes, like rolling die or flipping a coin. These are some of the first examples we'll typically study in probability theory. A quick question we might ask about this experiment is, what is the probability that we roll a 3, which we could denote as P of 3? Well, I think it's pretty intuitive to realize that in an experiment that has six possible outcomes that are all equally likely, the probability of any one of those outcomes occurring, like in this case the probability of rolling a 3, is 1 divided by the total number of possible outcomes, which in this case is 6. So that would be a probability of 1 over 6. And of course, since all the probabilities are equally likely, that is also the probability of rolling a 1, or a 2, or a 4, or a 5, or a 6. I think that seems pretty reasonable, but let's quickly justify for sure why that must be the case. Imagine we have some experiment with a sample space S. Then, suppose we add up the probabilities of all the outcomes in that sample space. So this summation notation just means add up all the probabilities, p of x for every x in the sample space S. In the case of our die example, that would be p of 1 plus p of 2 plus p of 3, and so on. What must this sum be equal to? Well, certainly, in an experiment with a sample space S, one of the outcomes in S has to happen. So if we add up all the probabilities, it must be equal to 1, because it's guaranteed that some outcome in the sample space needs to happen. However, if all of the probabilities are equal, say that the probability of x is equal to some number p for every outcome x in the sample space, then this sum is just adding the same probability p to itself over and over again for every possible outcome in the sample space. Then, if the sample space has a total of, say, n possible outcomes in it, so this is the cardinality of the sample space is equal to n, then this sum of all the probabilities in the sample space is just equal to n times p. That's the common probability shared by all of the outcomes, p, multiplied by the total number of outcomes, n. So the sum of all probabilities in the sample space with equally likely outcomes is n times p, which must be equal to 1, and so the probability of each outcome is equal to 1 divided by n, the total number of outcomes. So that's how we know that the probability of rolling any one number on a fair six-sided die is 1 over 6. In this case, n is equal to 6, that's the number of possible outcomes, and p, the probability of each outcome, is 1 over 6. Notice, as well, since we're dividing by n, this rule only applies to experiments with more than zero possible outcomes, which seems like a fine restriction because we're not very interested in experiments that have zero possible outcomes. Then, knowing this rule is true, we can solve lots of simple problems involving experiments with equally likely outcomes. For example, if we roll a fair six-sided die, what's the probability that we roll an even number? Well, we have to ask, how could this event happen? How could we roll an even number? Well, we could roll a 2, which has a probability of 1 over 6, or we could roll a 4, which also has a probability of 1 over 6, or we could roll a 6, which again has a probability of 1 over 6. So, since the probability of every individual outcome is the same, the probability that this event occurs, that we roll an even number, is just equal to the number of ways we can roll an even number, which is 3, 1 plus 1 plus 1, divided by the total number of possible outcomes, which is 6.
Notice that we could reduce this fraction if we wanted to, to one half, but oftentimes we're not going to want to do that. Leaving this fraction as 3 over 6 is going to make it a lot easier to compare it to other probabilities in the same experiment that we might not be able to reduce. For example, what's the probability that we roll a multiple of 3 on our six-sided die? Well, we just solved this problem the same way. How many ways can we roll a multiple of 3? We could roll 3, or we could roll 6. So there are two ways that we can roll a multiple of 3 out of 6 possible outcomes. So the probability is 2 over 6. Now, since we've left these two probabilities with a denominator of 6, we can very quickly see that the probability of rolling an even number is greater than the probability that we roll a multiple of 3, since 3 is greater than 2. We could even get a bit more complicated with a fun example like this. What's the probability that we roll a number that's even or a multiple of 3? To find this probability, we could use the same strategy we've been using. Just count the numbers that are even or multiples of 3, which would give us 2, 3, 4, and 6 for a total of 4 possibilities divided by the 6 possible outcomes. So the probability would be 4 over 6. The number of ways the event we're interested in can occur divided by the total number of possible outcomes of the experiment. But initially, you might have been tempted to solve this problem a different way, by adding up the probabilities of the two pieces of this event. So the probability of rolling something that's even or a multiple of 3, maybe we could find that by just adding the probability of a multiple of 3 to the probability of an even number. That would give us 3 over 6, plus 2 over 6, which is not equal to 4 over 6, the answer we got just a minute ago. This type of strategy works, and it's very effective and very useful. There's just one thing we need to be careful about. Do you see what the problem is? The problem is that 6 is both even and a multiple of 3, so it's being counted twice when we add these probabilities. So, to correct this answer, since we counted the probability of 6 occurring twice, we need to subtract it once. That corrects our answer, giving us what we expect, a probability of 4 over 6. And what we're seeing in action here is a principle that you'll use a lot as you continue to study probability theory called the inclusion-exclusion principle. But I hope this has been a helpful introduction to probabilities of experiments that have equally likely outcomes. Here's just a general statement of what we learned today. Let S be the sample space of an experiment with equally likely outcomes. Then, for any event A, which is a subset of S, the probability that the event A occurs is equal to the number of outcomes in the event A divided by the number of outcomes total, the number of possible outcomes in S. To draw this back to one of the examples we looked at, remember one of the events we asked about was the event that we roll an even number. The number of outcomes in that event of rolling an even number was 3, because we could roll a 2, 4, or a 6. And then the probability was just that number of outcomes in our event divided by the total number of outcomes, 6. We may also want to specify here that the cardinality of S is greater than zero, as in there's at least one possible outcome. Just specifying that, of course, because if the number of outcomes is zero, this formula doesn't hold, because we can't divide by zero. Now, with all that said, here's a quick practice problem to try on your own. A random number is chosen from the numbers 1 through 100. Assume that all of the numbers are equally likely to be chosen, so there are equally likely outcomes. What's the probability that the chosen number has two digits? Let me know what you get down in the comments, and I'll leave the solution in the description. So I hope this video helped you understand how to calculate probabilities involving equally likely outcomes. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet. And a big thanks to Valo who, upon my request, kindly gave me permission to use his music in my math lessons. Links to his music in the description.